from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin... In 1946, Winston Churchill raised the alarm, warning that tyranny was once again on the march in Europe. And all these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And all our subjects, in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from, uh, from Moscow. Churchill's words drew criticism on both sides of the Atlantic. Neither the British nor the American people were ready for another war. But in the months since Potsdam, the Soviet Union was behaving more like an enemy than an ally. Joseph Stalin's Red Army had projected his authority throughout Eastern Europe. Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and the Eastern Zone of Germany had come under the Soviet Union's sphere of influence. This was Stalin's buffer zone, assurance against future invasions. Initially, Stalin handpicked candidates to join coalition governments in these countries. But slowly, all opposing factions were eliminated until only the hardline communists remained. Many Eastern Europeans fled to escape the coming storm. Millions of others were forcibly deported. Scenes of mass expulsions were seared into the mind of one American intelligence officer. 27 boxcars packed and heading east to the Soviet work camps. Stalin continued to test the limits of the World War II Grand Alliance. He warned his people that war with the West was inevitable. Washington was at a loss to explain the hostility. What did the Soviet leader want? Were his ambitions limitless? The best answer came from George F. Kennan, who had spent years observing the Kremlin as an American diplomat stationed in Moscow. In an 8,000-word dispatch to Washington, now known as the Long Telegram, Kennan deciphered the Soviet riddle. At the bottom of the Kremlin's neurotic view of world affairs is the traditional and instinctive Russian sense of insecurity, he said. Stalin needed to present the outside world as hostile and menacing in order to justify his own bloody regime. This didn't mean that the Soviets desired war with the West, Kennan emphasized. Soviet leaders may be impervious to the logic of reason, but they would be highly sensitive to logic of force and would back down if confronted with strong resistance. A year later, writing under the pseudonym X, Kennan proposed a long-term, patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. Kennan's idea of containment formed the basis of American Cold War policy for the next 50 years. Before long, it was put to the test. In 1947, the British announced that they could no longer afford to support the pro-Western governments of the Mediterranean in their fight against communism. If the U.S. could not take up the burden, the whole region was in danger of falling under communist rule. The Truman administration responded decisively. On March 12, 1947, the president went before a joint session of Congress to request aid for the countries of Greece and Turkey. The address sent a clear message to the Soviet Union. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. The free peoples of the world look to us for support in maintaining their freedom. If we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world, and we shall surely endanger the welfare of this nation. 
the president's appeal was quickly dubbed the Truman Doctrine. It represented a dramatic change in U.S. foreign policy, but it merely laid the groundwork for what followed. A month later, Secretary of State George C. Marshall traveled to Europe. He witnessed firsthand the physical ruin, social disintegration, and economic collapse left by the war. Marshall warned that under these conditions, Europeans would turn to communism as an alternative to starvation and death. Two months later, Marshall proposed a program of massive economic assistance, the Marshall Plan. Our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. Its purpose should be the revival of a working economy in the world, so as to permit the emergence of political and social conditions in which free institutions can exist. European reaction to Marshall's speech was quick and positive. The British Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, hailed it as a lifeline to sinking men. Of all the nations invited to help draft the plan, only the Soviet Union and its satellites refused. The price would be high, up to $17 billion. But compared to the alternative, Marshall told Congress it was a bargain. This program should be viewed as an investment in peace. In those terms, the cost is low. While Congress debated the enormous financial commitment, communist-inspired riots led to the overthrow of the democratically elected government in Czechoslovakia. The events galvanized opinion on Capitol Hill, and Congress approved funding for the Marshall Plan. American aid was soon on its way to Europe. Food was distributed, machinery and technical support spurred new production. Homes and businesses were rebuilt. Marshall Plan aid provided nets for Flemish fishermen, money to rebuild Italian automotive factories, construction equipment for France, and coal to fuel Danish industry. The Marshall Plan was an overwhelming success. It launched Western Europe on the road to recovery, beat back the threat of communism in the region, and established the United States as the world's dominant economic superpower. It also contributed to the first major confrontation of the Cold War. At the Potsdam Conference in 1945, the Allies had agreed to temporarily divide Germany into four occupation zones, administered by the US, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and France. The German capital of Berlin, which lay deep within the Soviet zone, was partitioned in the same way. But three years later, Germany remained divided, and Berlin had become a microcosm of the Cold War struggle for all of Europe. The Soviet foreign minister emphasized the importance of the German capital. What happens to Berlin happens to Germany. What happens to Germany happens to Europe. The Soviets had plundered the eastern zone of Germany, hauling off machinery, equipment, train tracks, even entire factories to rebuild the Soviet Union. At the same time, the zones under Western control were beginning to thrive. To aid in the recovery, a new currency was introduced, the Deutschmark. Stalin condemned the move as American economic imperialism and retaliated. On June 24, 1948, he ordered all land access into the city of West Berlin to be sealed off, beginning the Berlin blockade. Roads and railways were shut down. Shipments of goods languished at border crossings. Power to the city was turned off. Stalin was determined to force the Western Allies out of West Berlin and starve its people into submission. The German capital symbolized American commitment to Europe, but was saving West Berlin worth the risk of war with the Soviets? There would be no debate. 
President Truman declared, we are going to stay, period. Within days, the United States and Great Britain orchestrated the Berlin Airlift to resupply the beleaguered city. Day and night, planes ferried in food, coal, and medical supplies. On average, a flight landed in West Berlin every three minutes. More than two million tons of cargo were delivered to Berlin during the 15-month operation. Each mission brought the threat of Soviet military intervention, but it never came, and the flights continued unchallenged. Finally, in May 1949, the Soviets relented and lifted the blockade. In its wake, any hopes to reunify the country were abandoned, and a permanently divided Germany became a reality. Democratic West Germany and Communist East Germany. The blockade underscored the need for a united defense against Soviet aggression. In 1949, the United States and Canada joined with 10 European nations to form a military alliance the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. A rebuilt, rearmed West Germany would join the alliance in 1955. In response, the Soviet Union and its satellites formed a competing alliance, the Warsaw Pact. Through 1948, the success of the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, and the Berlin Airlift had frustrated Soviet plans to dominate Europe. But the Red Star was rising, and 1949 would be an explosive year for world communism. In August, the Soviets stunned the world when they successfully tested their own atomic bomb, years ahead of expert predictions. And in China, communist revolutionary Mao Zedong prevailed in a decades-long civil war against the Chinese nationalist government Nearly 500 million Chinese fell under communist rule. For decades to come, Mao would be the linchpin of revolution in Asia, supporting fledgling governments in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Malaya, and in Korea, where the Cold War superpowers drew perilously close to World War III. 